Hi everybody, my name is Antoinette, this is Good Owl Games and welcome to October's monthly roundup video, the one where I talk to you about the changes to my board game collection. <laughs> Well firstly let me tell you it's incredibly stormy outside. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear it. I hope not. But yeah, it's 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 properly winter. Um, and hello. <laughs> and we're here to talk about board games, which is kind of the perfect winter thing, isn't it? Like, oh no, we're stuck indoors. Whatever shall we do? You know, it's reasons like this. You build a large board game collection, right? For, for outdoor misery. Um, but yes, hello and welcome to October. Um, so this video, as, as usual, and for those of you uninitiated who get to hear it anyway, is the one where, yeah, I talk about kind of the games I've been playing, the board games I've been buying, um, and some general chit chat about myself at the end. And you might want to listen to this one because I'm going to be taking a hiatus, I think, for a little while. Um, from Good L Games, but more details to follow later. I won't bore you all with that. Um, and right, so normally here we start at the top of the hour with the games we just bought, which is fair enough, and we may as well jump right into those. Um, so the last month, last month has been a bit of a mess um, in the real world, which has affected, you know, board games also in the real world. Um, so less games, I suppose, than normal, maybe more than last month, because last month was also kind of quiet. Um, but we're going to start up with the first new game of the month, and this is Boom Lake. Um, it's an Alexander Fister game in which you are um, kind of settling a land. But don't worry, there's nobody there. Nobody's been there for a thousand years, apparently. So there are no locals. We're just settling along this land that's along a river. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like... I. Just, I don't really expect these games to have much of a theme, to be very honest, um, or a setting, but I suppose it's better than doing something antiquated and out of date, like a, a lot of people seem to lean on um, for board game themes. So yeah, so Boon, Boon Lake. Um, so this is one I had my eye on for a little while, and this is entirely based on a photograph I saw of the player boards. So the kind of recess player boards where you put things into them. Um, and take things out and I always love those. Um, I love having your own board and I love being able to take things off of it or add things to it um, to keep track of what you're doing during the game. Big fan of that. Um, but what um, the what Moon Lake is really about, I suppose, like I'm going to do my best to say this really, um, I have played it twice so for once I'm more than one game in. Um, but what from, from my understanding is that on your turn, there is um, a set, a row of actions you can choose from. And <laughs> they will do various types of things around the board, um, like maybe, you know, let you put animals in the board, there's cattle in here for, for that, or to put like a little house out on the board. Um, and things they, like, the, you know, they're, they're basically all the actions you can do are in this list. Um, you can also play cards and the cards um, symbols will match some of these action symbols so that they can go together so you can play a card and do the action. Some of the actions allow your opponents to do things after you've completed your action. Nice touch, you know, um, which is fine. Um, <laughs> and the coolest thing about it, I suppose, for me is how you manage your resources. You have basically like a little boat on your board and you mark in one of the three types of resources. And if your boat is there, um, it'll give you that number of resources plus one for the boat. So you can move your boat back and forth to get the right resources to be able to afford to play these cards. Um, that you can, you can do things with. Some of the cards will stay in play and give you victory points. Some of them can kind of help you during the game as well. What I was mostly interested in is the fact that you go down a river, the, <laughs> um, and you move along and as you cross particular points um, you'll kind of stop the game for a bit and score things and then you'll carry on. Um, so <laughs> not describing this very well because I'm basically just talking about the different kinds of actions you can do but that really is kind of what the game is about. It really is just a flurry of actions um, and a lot of symbols as well um, that I found it hard to keep up with, I think, at the best of times, despite having played it twice. I just didn't feel familiar enough with everything. Um, there are also numerous ways to kind of score points and things like that as you go along. Um, but it did feel fun, and that's the strange part. Like, I'm describing it out loud here, and I'm like, this sounds miserable. But it's kind of good-looking, but all of the 
all of the mechanisms are kind of entertaining I quite you know what I mean I kind of liked what I was doing um and like I was trying to clear off my board and certain aspects get all the houses and kind of cows out on the board because you know I'd had a card that said for your cows you could score this um there's a lot going on here I think there's loads of different ways you could play it and I think I think that appeals to me too and it was kind of colorful and and whatnot um but yeah the symbols might be a bit of an issue for people um, for those of you who have played it, I was wondering, do you like it better or, or worse than Great Western Trail? Um, to me, it felt less serious than Great Western Trail, but I'm not sure either. I think the, the extra kind of symbol complexity took it down a few notches, maybe in my estimation. But um, that's been my experience of Boon Lake. Um, I'd love to hear about yours. Yeah, I did enjoy it. I would, I would play it again. Do I feel like I fully understood everything that was going on? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> but I did, I, I found like my strategy and I just did my strategy, you know that, but I, I think there's a lot more to that game than I got to explore. Um, so yeah, fun and entertaining. So that's Bloom Lake. So the next game appeared in our board game shop and I kind of couldn't help myself. Um, and part of this is to do with the fact that I recently saw a movie called Bullet Train. Um, and I really liked it. It was kind of over the top fun, kind of violence, you know, all on a bullet train. Um, and so when I saw a board game about a bullet train, I was like, this is clearly a sign. Um, so this game's name is, and I'm going to make sure I pronounce it correctly, um, Shinkansen Zero Kai. So this is a game about, well, building a bullet train. And it's done before the Olympics that were held in Japan. And basically what you're doing is you are trying to clear off certain parts of the track so that you can place stations there. And you're doing this by, you have your own train and it's got its own ability. And then at the start of each round, you get to add a new ability to your train to help you kind of do these things more efficiently, get money, things like that. So you're having to, to kind of decide which actions to take where um, on the board and things like that. Um, it's pretty simple, um, but I do like how it looks. Um, I, we did have problems with the rule book, which is why I think I'm having a hard time remembering exactly, you know, how well this game goes because we weren't sure about certain things, you know, that I think this is probably the first game in ages where I sat here to tell you about it and I couldn't remember. I had to run inside and ask my husband. I'm like, do you remember how we played this? Um, so there's that. Um, but I did think it was interesting. It was doing something kind of unique and I want to give it an, another go. And I like the idea of cleaning, clearing the route and filling out the train and things like that. Um, so it had a couple of kind of unique touches. Um, the box art is gorgeous as well, and it's nice all set up. Um, so that was kind of a, a board game adventure, I think I'm going to call that, um, but one that needs kind of further exploring for sure. So yeah, bullet trains, always good. Okay, what was next? So I'll go with the one with the most difficult name to pronounce first. Um, so some time ago, maybe you heard me um, talk about Nidva Nidvalier, Nidvalier, I call it. Nidvalier, yeah, yeah. Um, but apparently there was a new expansion for it that I discovered in my board game shop and I was like, yoink. And it's called Idaval. So Nidvalier Idaval. Um, I suppose, firstly, I should tell you a little bit about Nidvalier. That's how I call it. I hope I'm not wrong. Probably am. Um, and I got this game a while back and it's very impressive. So Nid Filaire is a, a bidding game in which you are um, basically trying to bribe dwarves to come and work for you. And how this works is that everyone has a set of coins and there are three taverns or so to bid on and everyone secretly bids with their coins um, on whoever they want to add to their tavern. So there are multiple colored dwarves and each one will score slightly differently. So like the blue dwarves are just straight up worth victory points. Um, the orange dwarves have kind of like a multiplication thing going on and both the orange are not orange, the purple and the green um, dwarves have kind of a table where if you have enough of them, you will get an X points. So you can kind of see where I'm going here. So you're basically wanting to draft these different colors um, into your lines or your rows of dwarves um, so that you can get points. So 
Um, it's fun bidding in this one for a very simple reason, and I normally hate bidding games, is that you don't have to win to get something. Um, so, you know, you can, you and your, you and your friend can bid on the, there's three dwarves, I think a two player in each, in each row. Um, and maybe you don't want the first one. Maybe you want the second, the second one or something like that. You don't have to bid to make sure you get something every time. Um, the other fun part about this game is that you have a coin that allows you to upgrade other coins to better numbers. So you get like a little tray uh, or display cabinet for all of the big numbered coins. Um, and so, you know, the game can kind of escalate that way as you get more more points, as you, you know, get more coins, um, bigger bidding, better get more coins to counteract the bigger bidding, that kind of stuff. Um, and so the, I really, really liked Knit Filler. Um, it, it was oh, it was such a surprise when we got it first, and we played an awful lot of it. Um, so I already have one expansion, and that's Thing Villier. Oh, you gotta love it, right? Um, and I think what that added was there were there were extra type of cards you could kind of add to your deck. There were kind of non-colored ones, and I think it also had dual colored dwarves as well that could count for either sets of colors, if that's if that's correct. And then recently then um, we just saw that they had an entirely new um, expansion. What, and let, let me call it correct again. Idaval, Idaval, right? Yeah, Idaval. So they, they come in tiny boxes, there's just some more cards. So in this case, what this one has done is it has added in like an extra tavern for you to buy dwarves from, except it's using these kind of special mythical cards they have. Um, and these work a bit different to everything else. So for example, I drafted a Valkyrie and it said every time I upgraded my coins, um, she would get extra victory points, which is cool. Some of them were just flat worth victory points or had an ability. Um, and they only stay for like the first couple of rounds and then they disappear. So what ha it ended up happening was the game was a little bit longer. So we had really big scoring pools compared to normal. Um, but I really like these. They didn't feel very, they give, you, they give you counters for a lot of them to put on things. I wish they were nicer, but it didn't feel very fiddly or extra. It felt like it just fitted in. If that makes sense. It felt like these could be easily be part of everything else you were playing with. Um, so I quite, I quite like those as well. Um, although I don't know about adding length, length to the game every time. But yeah, I'm a, hu I'm a huge fan of this. Um, and yeah, I've been enjoying the expansions. They seem to be kind of at least thoughtful, I think is the way I want to say it, um, where they fit in seamlessly with what you're already playing. They're doing something different, but not like, not some serious departure from it. So yeah, if you haven't tried out Nid Valir, um just yet and you feel like drafting colored dwarves and making them match to get points, well then you should definitely check it out because it's quick and fun and um, it's nice. It, yeah, it, it's a really pleasant game to play. So um, there's that. And then the final thing on my list is something I've not played yet and I'm not going to play for another month. And the reason being is that I got my first advent calendar. <laughs> I got the exit um, advent calendar. <gasps> And I'm mighty frightened. Has anyone done one of these before? I'm not good at exit games or puzzles or anything. But um, yeah, I've never had an advent calendar. Did you guys have those growing up? I know my friends did, where you would open the little door a day while you were kind of waiting for Santi or something like that um, and see what was inside. I never had one. So when there was a board game one available, it seemed like the right thing to do. Um, so yeah, um, I have a feeling it's going to be full of fiendish puzzles and I'm just going to be frustrated by the time it gets to Christmas. But sure, maybe it'll be fun. I don't know. Did anyone do one of these before? I saw them out last year um, and I never got a chance to buy one. So who knows what this might bring? Hopefully Christmas, but um, yeah, I have to wait till November for that. Um, does it sound like something fun for you? Would you do like a puzzly advent calendar? I'm sure there's some of you out there who have those kind of feelings. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that is everything I bought this month. I want to hear about what you've been picking up. Are you kind of like prepping for like the darkness now going, oh, we better get our games in for Christmas? Um, yeah, I'm allowed to talk about Christmas now because it's after Halloween. Ooh, um, I do love a bit of Halloween. But yeah, so now everything is going to be lit up and red and sparkles for like months. Um, so brace yourselves, people. Um, right, so let's go on to the games I've been playing. Um, you heard about most of them, but there's always one or two more to tell you about. 
Actually, there's one more game I forgot to mention, but it came and left so quick that, you know, it was it didn't even make it to my list. And you might have noticed that I put out two videos there recently, one of which was on a weekend, which is very rare and unusual. And that was for matches from Thing 12 Games, um, which was on Kickstarter. Um, and what happened here was um, I was supposed to receive a copy of it many moons ago um but you know what happens as reviewers is people say they'll send you a copy of something and you're like that's great and then it never shows up and then um and it turns out that you know they just decided not to send it to you maybe it was too expensive maybe they had somewhere else for it or something like that and that you know that's fine that happens all the time so i just kind of assumed that for whatever reason i wasn't needed um until uh, the games designer got in touch uh, the games publisher got in touch with me i was like have you not got your where's your not got your copy yet and i'm like no no copies here so mine has arrived mine arrived late um it arrived a week before the end of the kickstarter and i was like oh god i don't think i'll be able to get anything made um but i sat down to play matches and it is a trick-taking game um i don't normally go well with those um but it was about like setting things on fire and keeping things warm and i liked it i liked it a lot and i felt like you guys should hear about it before the Kickstarter. So um, yeah, I did my best. It was a, I don't want to say it was a rush job, but it kind of, it kind of was. I think I could have made the intro video a little better with a little more time, but um, I did, I did my best, and I think matches deserved it because you know what? I was actually quite a fun game. It's not something I'd normally pick up. I won't lie, but I enjoyed it nonetheless, and I love how the game looked. I liked the theme. So it made sense for it to have its own video, which is why it was coming out late. Um, so if you haven't heard about Matches, um, you might want to check it out. I think it's funded on Kickstarter, at least. I, I hope it was. I think I checked. Um, but, you know, they might still be taking like pledges or something like that if you're into trick taking games. Um, and, and, you know, very um, stylish ones at that. I thought it was a beautiful game. Um, so, yeah, so I had to mention Matches because... Um, I got, I got there in the end, <laughs> um, uh, so I hope I hope that helps, and I hope um, you know you'll have all checked out the video to hear what it was all about for real. Right, okay. So enough about games I've acquired because it was also a game I played. But here we go. So I'm going to put it straight out there. Games I've been playing. Number one, Scythe. Scythe, um, which someone uh, very cleverly on Twitter called like a classic. And I wasn't so sure how I felt about that word sitting in with Scythe, but it does feel a little bit like a classic at this point, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, so Scythe is, I, I suppose it's not that old, is it? In board game terms, maybe it's ancient. But Scythe was an incredibly popular board game, sometimes based on its art and sometimes based on its gameplay. Um, Scythe has this stunning art where it's all kind of like robots mixed in with Russian peasants and things like that. Um, it's like a, a world where you know, like two worlds collided um, and it's beautiful. And then the game is kind of built around that kind of theme as well. Um, and so you play as one of a number of factions. Um, each have, you know, their own kind of powers or things they're good at. And what you're trying to do is to claim kind of victory stars by doing various things in the game. So there's a whole host of these to choose from and you can choose to do whichever ones you like. So sometimes there'll be things like, you know, gathering food, winning combat, getting to the center of the board. Um, so yeah, there's a whole list of them to do. But the, the fun part for me first side has always been your player boards because your player boards are in kind of like two halves. And what you're trying to do is you, you start the game with your player board and it, it lists all of your actions on it. Um, and there'll be a top action and a bottom action. And you place your pawn out on which one you're doing. So you do the top half of the action. And then if you can afford to or whatever, you do the bottom half. And those pairings are really in, are really interesting, um, like trying to get done what you need to need to do. Um, so in total, there are eight actions, um, and these are things like you know making people, getting food, um, going up various tracks, building monuments, building mechs. Mechs are important. You got to get your places, um, and things like that. So there's there's a lot going on there. But I love that element of choosing the pair and trying to have set yourself up in such a way that you can activate to the top and the bottom of the action at the same time. Um, what I really love about side is there's loads of different ways to play it. 
you know, you don't, you could go around just fighting people, fair enough. You could go around and just gather workers or just make food or, you know, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of different approaches here. Um, the one thing I hate about Scythe and I have always hated and I still not changed on this fact is that the game ends once someone puts out their fifth kind of glory kind of star where they've done, you know, completed one of the little kind of game quests. And the game ends immediately and you can put out multiple stars in a turn so i've had it happen to me very often where i'm trying to see how many stars people have out i'm like oh i have another turn or two to go and then my opponent will put out like two or maybe three stars together and the game ends and there's nothing else you can do um i hate that sense of futility <laughs> that you don't get a final turn um and that's the one thing i hate about side but I pulled it off the shelf um, for the first time in, I want to say, a year and a half. And I, I was on a day where I couldn't decide what I wanted to play. I had no notion. And I was like, let's just take down side and see what it's like. Um, and I for, I'd forgotten, you know, the delight that when you see all your pieces. I think there's something very special about that, about um, side. Um, so um, I own a good number of the expansions for it and the Rise of Fenris expansion, which I can heartily recommend um, because I enjoyed it so much. Like it's a series of, you know, eight games, I think, or 10 games where you unlock things as you go along. There's a bit of a story and the things you unlock, you can play with then in your regular game. Um, and yeah, I think that really made me like Scythe a lot more because you had to play kind of similar games back to back with the same team or the same faction. So I think it taught me, yeah, I, it was a real like teaching lesson. So I will always recommend that. Um, but yeah, so how has side stood up in other people's minds? I know it was like a big buzzword for ages. People were going on about side and it seems to have dimmed down a bit now, but the game itself really is still something pretty exceptional. So yeah, side is just one of those kind of comfort games for me. Um, I like that it felt so good when I took it off the shelf after all this time. You know, that's a that's a good thing, I think, to be able to say about a board game. Um, so yeah, let me know your thoughts on it, because it's been around now for a while, um, and see what people make of it. All right, we'll do one more. Um, and this is Aeon's End. Now, I, <laughs> I have a bit of a caveat here. I have a number of versions of Aeon's End, I think, at this point. I have Aeon's End Legacy war with the i don't know i've a, we've a couple of different boxes of them and of course with a aeon's end it's a it's a card game so they can all kind of play together but aeon's end is one of those games that uh, i don't understand why it makes sense but it does because it's a cooperative card game and cooperative doesn't normally go down great around here um we i don't know i don't know whether we're just a really good team but when we cooperate we usually win um, <laughs> or, you know, someone gets told what to do, you know, it's kind of that, you know, leader problem. But for some reason, when it comes to Aeon's End, which is a card drafting deck building game, um, that is cooperative, <laughs> it just seems to work really, really well. And I think the reason for this being is that, so Aeon's End, you pick a character, they'll have some unique cards in their deck and a special ability for how they're played. And there will be a tableau of cards to purchase from in the middle. And then there is a boss or a monster that you are fighting. And each one of these is unique. They'll come with all kind of various abilities. They'll have their own little deck of cards that flips over and things might happen. Like I said, each one's different. I'm just generalizing here, but they're, they're normally kind of cool and unusual. And how it works is that, you know, um, there, this is the best part. There isn't really a turn order. There's a turn order deck. <laughs> so you have, there's two goes for you, two goes, let's say, for your opponent, well, your, your friend, I suppose, in this case, isn't it? And then the monster will also get two goes. And you shuffle those cards up and deal them out and see who comes in what order. So you can't predict that you're going to get a turn, I'm going to get a turn, or that the monster won't get two turns back to back. And I think that adds something very important to the game. I think it gets rid of some of that that leader problem because you can't tell how things are going to pan out right and so on your turn you can prep spells you can use abilities you can buy more things for your deck the cool thing about the deck is there's a set order to when things go in your graveyard um, at the end of the turn they go there and when you run out of cards you don't shuffle up your deck you just flip it over and you start drawing from the top a, this saves on a bunch of shuffling, um, but B, it kind of allows you to set up your deck a little bit if you're careful in how you buy and use your cards, which I really like a lot. 
But the thing I suppose that strikes me the most about Aeon Send is that it is difficult. Um, as in, as I said at the start, myself and my husband normally pretty much beat everything when we play cooperatively. That's not the truth in this. It's one of the few games where we've actually lost games um, and things like that. Um, and it, it, can, it can be challenging. And some of that is, well, the monster got two turns in a row or things like that. But most of it is just that you have to really focus um, on, what you, on what you're doing and figuring out what's important at what time matters too. So it's like, do I kill this thing now or do I go straight for the boss? Or should we deal with this? Who's going to lose hit points to do this? Um, so this is, this is the idea behind Aeon's End. Um, I love the variety in the cards and in the characters and in the bosses. It's huge and it's very impressive. Um, I have so many characters I've still yet to even try and play with. And then so many different combinations of different cards that you might draft into your deck that makes your deck different every time you play. Like this game has oodles and oodles and oodles of um, good feelings going for it. Um, so I'm a big Aeon's End fan and we played it at the, the weekend. Now we did win, um, but it was tough. <laughs> It was tough. I played a completely different character I hadn't played before. I was trying to figure out. Um, my husband was doing most of the damaging stuff and then I was kind of trying to deal with all the other bits and bobs. Um, so yeah, it's really fun. Um, I would heartily recommend it. I think it's a, an incredibly well designed and thought out game. And yeah, uh, if, you, if you like cards and co-ops um, and defeating monsters together, like yeah, I couldn't, I, it couldn't get better than this, I think. <laughs> So do I have any Aeon's End fans out there? Um, I was very disappointed with the legacy version that um, we bought last. That was a bit rubbish. But uh, you do get to use all of the things that came in the legacy box. So I don't feel like I lost out. I got a bunch of new monsters and characters and stuff to play with. So there's that. Um, but yeah, but overall, I think, yeah, it's just good stuff. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So I'm going to wrap up with the whole what I've been playing bit. <laughs> I'm probably rambling a little bit. I've been kind of sick, so I'm not sure where to start or where to stop all these sentences. Um, but I'm going to jump into the personal bit for now. So no board games, but if you want to hear, I don't know, about bicycles and movies and um, my upcoming hiatus, then roll all over here with me. All right. OK, so um, this has been one hell of a month. I've been really sick for the past week or so, which is why this video is late. I'm making it on the, the day it should have been released because I lost an entire week of life thanks to being sick. And no, it wasn't COVID. I still haven't caught COVID. Fingers crossed. I thought this was it. I thought I was like, my time is coming. Eventually I will have to catch it, but it hasn't happened yet. But no, it's just proper like, you know, winter flu kind of sick. So I couldn't even look at my computer or my phone for like a week. Um, but you know, maybe that's a, a, pos a positive thing. Um, but what I'm going to start with is that this is probably the last monthly round I'm going to make this year. Um, yeah, I just want to take a break, I suppose, from Good Ale Games for a bit. I'm just, I'm very tired and I'm kind of, I don't know, I think I've run out of patience with kind of on, on with the online world a little bit. Because, see, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining necessarily. I'm not not sure that I am but I just know that certain things are making me feel a particular way and maybe it's just that I need a break to kind of sit back and reevaluate, which is very possible so I'm calling this a hiatus and not a quitting or anything like that just yet um, but I just wanted to see what my life would be like I suppose if I wasn't centered around um, doing this stuff all the time because it's just something to do with the nature of being online I think that makes it kind of inherently competitive even if you don't really care about that stuff, it'd be nice for people to see the things you make, right? So that instantly means, you know, there's a whole approach you need to be taking to things, um, you know, to, to, ha to have people see your stuff. Um, and I'm just, I'm not interested in being that type of person. I'm not much of a saleswoman or anything like that. Sure, I feel like I have something to say and def definitely some of you are here um, and enjoying it, you know, and that's incredibly lovely. Um, but... I don't know. It's it's just a bit of a funny. It's just a bit of a funny one. I think maybe I just need a break for a while, um, and come back kind of rejuvenated after that, because you know, for me, this is all a lot of hard work. Maybe for other people, less so. 
Um, but you know, I guess not everyone has my kind of circumstances so <laughs> and whatnot. So yeah, so that's the plan. I'm gonna just take a break. I have a number of videos still to come out. I've worked my ass off the past week or so trying to get everything finished so that I could just kind of have just just be like, oh, it's done. Um, so yeah, there's you've got some things to look forward to yet. Um, I'm sure if you're looking to contact me or anything like that, you can always contact me through Twitter or something like that because I'll still get those messages. I assume, I assume. Who knows? We'll see, we'll see what shape this will take. I have no idea yet, but for now I was just like, let's just see what happens if I'm not just doing this. Um, so yeah, so there you go, that, that's the plan. Um, so in other news, because it's been such a dodgy month, um, I haven't been to the cinema as much as I would like. Um, yeah, our car broke down and it, the car was like away for a week, so we were carless. Yeah, really sad story. Uh, we were on our way to Dublin, um, driving in the dark of the early morning and we heard a thud, a, like a big thud. And we're like, what the hell? Um, and apparently it was a dead deer in the middle of the road and we ran right over it. I'm like, oh God. So our car was stuck in a faraway location getting fixed for like a week or more so that was that was fun the adventures of like no cars <laughs> so there was no cinema um and stuff like that and then being sick now on top of that for another week it's left this being pretty terrible month i think overall um but i did finally get to go see um banshees of inish erin um yesterday so for those of you who aren't familiar with it it's an irish film it's set in one of the iron islands um it's set in like i want to say 1912 uh, or 1916 the kind of around the whole irish rebellion -y time so it's like back back in the past a bit and it's about like colin farrell and <laughs> and what's his face ah oh, i forgot his name i'll think of it in a minute basically about two irish fellas living on an island and one of them decides he doesn't want to be friend with his friends anymore with his friend anymore um and that is the plot of the movie it's pretty dark um it's very irish like you know with the, the whole crowd was laughing along with it i don't know if the rest of the world will understand that the way we do but um yeah it had a very yeah kind of dark for sure um but i enjoyed that um i'm trying to think i saw a bunch of actual cool movies um recently may as well just check the log yet again i'll throw that out there does anybody use letterbox I don't know. It's like a it's an app, it's like a social media app, but for movies. Now I'm not using it that way, but I'm keeping a list of things I'm watching. Um, and I'm always curious to hear what other people might be watching because I'm following Ian O'Toole on there, the board game art designer. Um, so I'm like, here we go. What else did we watch? Have a little quick. I watched a bunch of stuff at home because I was sick. Um, some Halloween themed things. So I watched the original Frankenstein. I watched Edward Scissor's Hands um what i watched forbidden planet okay maybe not halloween but it was in with the old stuff and things like that let's see oh I, okay so i saw the woman king in cinemas as well is that the only other thing i've seen this month wow i'm slow this month that was actually really interesting um i was afraid it was going to be a bit too epic for my taste but i i really liked it i feel like you got to very much identify with the characters and it's about an african tribe who are basically trying to get get rid of slavery in a sense um but there's there's more going on than that um but yeah i really liked it i was i wasn't expecting it to be my kind of thing but it, it did a, a really good job and i should stop touching this while i talk to you um i actually went and saw the minions movie the one about grew um <laughs> you know what it was free can't no judgment it was free so i went to see it not really impressed with it at all to be honest um but i kind of knew that going in that's why i hadn't been there so yeah i have a lot of catching up to do when it comes to movies um being behind a bit and with cycling i think the last time you were here i told you i was getting a bike i got a bike um it's incredibly pretty and very scary um but i'm learning to cope <laughs> i think the hardest part of the bike for me is getting over the fear um because it's something i haven't done in a, a long time and it and if it feels so it feels <laughs> this is weird it feels very familiar because you know you never forget how to ride a bike but also so alien because it's something i haven't done in forever and i'm kind of half remembering things i used to do as a cyclist a long time ago now 
while trying to figure out my bike and of course I had the problem where I didn't want to raise my saddles because I felt I felt safer being able to touch the ground with my feet when I needed to but then I think that was also terribly bad for kind of like my posture and the ability to stretch my legs so I've had to like elevate that I think I'm getting a little more confident but um it's been tough I think you know there is nothing um more testing of your body than when you try to do a different exercise um because gosh um it was it was tough and it's still kind of tough I'm getting used to it like I'm up to now where I can do like a two kilometer cycle in about 10 minutes don't laugh I had to work very hard to get there but it's exhausting like it's not getting any easier and I'm still doing it and doing it and doing it <laughs> I'm just like when will this click when will this get better um i assume it will someday but the weather now has been pretty shocking here the past bit so i haven't been able to get out on the bike but we wait and hope for the clearing of the skies um yeah so there's that so anything else happening around here no just it's been like i said it's been kind of quiet month and i'm just tired so I'm wrapping things up here um, and I want to thank you all for being on this journey with me. I hate saying that word, this journey, but I suppose, no, but that is absolutely what this is. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you giving your time and your energy to kind of listen into my videos and whatnot. And I hope you will have a fantastic Christmas with lots of games to tell me about in the new year. Um, you know, and that hopefully you've bought something that maybe I recommended once, who knows? All right, I'm going to call it quits here. Um, and yeah, happy Christmas and happy New Year, everybody. Um, and survive the winter, winter, the winter with all good, with all good games. Yes, board games for all. Woohoo. All right, everybody. Take care. Bye bye.